not challenging these cases would mean that I would give up the rights that are guaranteed in the Constitution, not just freedom of the press, but also the rights of Filipinos to information, to hold power to account. A lie told a million times becomes fact. Without facts, we don't have truth. Without truth, we don't have trust. Without any of these three, democracy as we know it is dead. Facts are the foundation of our information ecosystem. Don't be afraid, because if you don't use your rights, you will lose them. When, when power, great power, tries to hang a Damocles sword over your head, if you allow it to affect you, they succeed. Because you're not doing the kind of journalism, the investigative journalism we should be doing. So what we have learned in Rappler is we swat it away and we keep our eye on the ball. Um, I, it makes me wor wonder and worry, what is the government afraid of? Why are they afraid of journalists? Good night, everyone. Buenas noches a todos y a todas. Eh, soy Carla Minet, directora ejecutiva del Centro de Periodismo Investigativo. And I am the executive director of CPI. And we welcome you tonight um, to this event and conference uh, with Maria Reza. Journalism is not a crime. Good night, Maria, and thanks for joining CPI audience tonight. Um, as you all know, this event is uh, the last step on our uh, mid-year fund fundraising one week campaign. And we are very cr close to our goal. Uh, we still have until tonight to get there. Um, so I want to take this moment to thank you all uh, for supporting CPI, for sharing our stories, for praising our great team of reporters and for being such good fans of our work um, and critics of our work too. Um, journalism is not a crime, it's a mantra that I uh, can imagine repeats itself in Maria's mind because her fight for a daily chance to do independent journalism and without constraints is to say the least challenging. Inspiration, courage, generosity, and strength. Those are the words that describe my memories from the times that I've heard Maria Reza speak. Uh, I had the opportunity and the privilege to learn about her life last year in Hamburg at the Global Conference uh, of Investigative Journalism, where she was the keynote speaker surrounded by hundreds of international investigative journalists from Kenya to the Netherlands to Brazil and Cuba, Maria stood in a bench to get to the microphone uh, and she heard with emotion the standing ovation even without saying a word. Um, Maria will talk to us today about what it takes to exercise uh, freedom of speech in extreme circumstances and about the importance of the free independent press everywhere. She is a frontline critic of Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte. Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch claim that Duterte was responsible for extrajudicial killings and in Philippines. Instead of denying such allegations, he embraced them. The death squads that had carried out the killings operated with an impunity that implied official sanction. And Duterte openly praised both the methods and their apparent results. Duterte vowed to reintroduce death penalty in the Philippines, abolished in 2006. Maria has been a journalist in Asia for nearly 35 years, and she co-founded Rappler a top digital only news site that is leading the fight for freedom of the press in Philippines. As Rappler's executive direct editor and CEO, she has endured constant political harassment and arrests by the Duterte government. 
and she has been forced to post bail eight times to stay free. In June 2020, a Manila, Manila court convicted Reza um, on the criminal charge of cyber libel. And uh, she faces up to six years in jail in, in the case that is based on correcting a single typo in a story. That typo was containing a story published in 2012. And uh, before the cyber, cyber libel um, law came into effect, However, prosecutors argued that uh, the 2014 type of correction constituted a republication, making it subject to the law. Before founding Rappler, Maria focused on investigating terrorism in Southeast, Southeast Asia. She opened and ran CNN's Manila Bureau for nearly a decade before opening the network's Jakarta Bureau. Um, she has uh, published a few books and she has been fighting the criminalization of her work. Um, she pleaded not guilty to tax ev ev evasion charges recently and uh, she said that the charges against her were politically motivated and meant to harass and to intimidate. That said, I think we all want to hear what you have to say, Maria, and we will chat and uh, have a conversation afterwards. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me and CPI, my gosh, I, I hope you get the targets to, uh, today uh, at, at, at the end of the day. Uh, uh, you know, it is so good to talk to you. I see, you know, we have more than 50 people on the call. I guess the first is just, we have to understand how critically important each one of our roles is. You know, we are standing on the rubble of the past. Your uh, uh, primaries began and it's far from perfect, uh, but the goal of everything we are living through, the information operations that are manipulating us on social media, the goal of all of this is to make us all lose trust. And Puerto Rico has had many things happen to it. I, I worry about, you know, your own trust in the system. And I guess despite everything that's happened to me and to Rappler, that's one of the things we tried to safeguard that regardless of how flawed and how we have seen the abuses of power, that we have to somehow install our faith. And I guess, let me let me start with this. I have I have roughly a 20 minute presentation to show you. Carla has seen parts of it and I've updated it for after the conviction on June 15th, because of course it never stops. As, as you know, um, just yesterday, uh, Jimmy Lai, who is, you know, he's a media tycoon. He is, Apple Daily getting raided in Hong Kong is a shock. Uh, this has just happened. And I guess one of the things we know is that a, a body blow in one part of the world against journalists is a body blow to all of us. So that's the other part. Let me start with this and I will, I'll share my screen. Uh, I'll start with, um, oh, you've disabled screen sharing. Is it possible? Yay, I got it. Okay, so here we go. I'll start with just a two minute video before I go into the, the, the presentation. Here we go. Mr. President, is it important that people be afraid of you? Yes. Hello and welcome. I'm Maria Ressa. Maria Ressa carries the torch of press freedom in a country held in thrall by a populist president. It started with the drug war. Do not do drugs because I will kill you. President Duterte began his administration with the drug list. This is the drug industry of the Philippines. He showed everyone a list. People on that list started dying. I'm telling the Filipino people it's gonna be bloody. We demanded the government be held accountable. Duterte was annoyed by our reporting. You are a fake news outlet. You will be allowed to criticize us, but you go to jail for your crime started getting an attack on social media. The government created disinformation networks so people have no idea what the truth is. 
I was getting an average of 98 messages per hour. We don't even know whether we can trust the police to protect us. Just because you're a journalist, so right, you're exempted from We didn't even realize how dangerous it is for you. Why are you crying? I'm scared for you. Maria Ressa has been arrested. The charges against Ressa were aimed at intimidating those who challenged the territory's rule. So why should you care about what happens in the Philippines? They test the tactics of how to manipulate America in our country. If it works, they port it over to the rest of the world. Maria Ressa was one of four journalists named as Time Magazine's Person of the Year. Maria won't be afraid. I'm afraid for her. That's why I've never given up. What we're seeing is death by a thousand cuts. Little cuts to Philippine democracy. We will not duck. We will not hide. We will hold the line. Let me quickly go through how the attacks on democracy focus on the attacks on journalists and how the attacks on journalists are really the first warning signs that we've received. You know, uh, I'm old. Uh, I By next year, I'll have been a journalist for 35 years. And uh, it's sad that I began my career at the beginning when the when people power that was coined in the Philippines. And the Philippines is very similar to Puerto Rico. We, we joke that you know we spent 300 years in a convent, Spanish colonial rule, and then 50 years in Hollywood. Uh, we were a colony of the United States. Um, but I think the difference from the beginning to now is that news groups, news organizations used to be able to protect journalists. Now, the attacks are very, very personal. And that's kind of what I will show you. And uh, thank you, Carla and Rigel, because the videos that you showed chose the best of the soundbite. So let me, I think, let me talk about the impact of social media, um, which which is part of the video that you've already seen. You know, the, we started the attacks against Rappler began four years ago, and it comes in many directions. And I think if you are a journalist and you are a woman, you will have felt it far more <laughs> because our data shows us that women journalists are actually attacked at least 10 times more than men. Um, so this is how the, the title of, of, of our talk today is um, uh, journalism is not a crime, but in many, many parts of the world uh, in at least 72 countries, that is the number of countries where cheap armies on social media are rolling back democracy. That's Oxford's Computational Propaganda Research Project. In, in at least 72 countries around the world, journalism is becoming a crime. Um, yesterday, I talked about Jimmy Lai being arrested in Hong Kong, right? Uh, my, my cases, which Carla outlined for you. How does it begin? Um, it starts with social media. And I'll start with, you know, compressing everything. Uh, the idea that journalism is a crime. Journalist equals criminal. In my case, it was very personal. And I'll start with 2016, four years ago. Uh, in 2016, in the Philippines, this narrative that journalist equals criminal was seeded into the information ecosystem. And I'll, I'll tell you why the Philippines. Uh, number one, the Philippines, for the fifth year running, we spend the most time on social media globally, five years in a row now, um, more than 10 hours a day on the internet. Uh, that's the one. Number two is 100% of Filipinos on the internet are on social media. On Facebook, um, Facebook is our internet. Uh, and that kind of makes sense because Facebook is now the world's largest distributor of news. So in 2016, uh, soon after President Duterte uh, was elected, he was elected in May 2016, right? A month later was Brexit. So soon after he was elected, journalism equals criminal was seeded. It was targeted to me. Uh, in, and when I first saw it on, social, on Facebook, I was like, oh, well, that's okay. No problem. Go ahead. 
let's see. Because I figured, you know, I've been a journalist for a long time. I've been around and that can't really take root. Well, when you repeat a lie, lace it with anger and hate, you repeat it a million times, it becomes a fact. That is our information ecosystem today. And what happened was many more, it kept getting repeated in 2016, so it was astroturfing bottom up. Then in 2017, President Duterte, in his State of the Nation address, essentially said the same thing. Maria Ressa is a criminal. Uh, he, he attacked Rappler for being um, foreign owned. We've seen this in many countries around the world. It's not true. And I, and I tweeted him immediately, Mr. President, that's not true. You're wrong. But when, when the top official says it, and then other officials repeat the same thing, you get sandwiched, right? So you have astroturfing bottom up, and then officials top down and you're getting squeezed. And then in 2018, just a few weeks, uh, sorry, one about a week after President Duterte did that, we got our first subpoena. In 2018, the Philippine government filed 11 cases, 11 cases and investigations against me and Rappler. In 2019, that's when you saw the video of the arrests. I was arrested twice in a five week period. Uh, eight arrest warrants issued by the government in 2019. I had, there were weeks when I would spend four days in four different courts and I would have to defend myself, right? The, the end goal of all of that, of course, is a war of attrition to take my attention, my organization's attention away from what was happening to drain our resources. That's the other part. Uh, and then finally in 2020, um, I was convicted along with a former colleague. So journalism equals criminal. Maria Ressa is not a journalist, she's a criminal. What seemed far-fetched in 2016 is actually a reality in 2020, right? So this is how you change reality, how you turn the world upside down, how you destroy trust in news and in journalists. Um, I think before, before we go to questions, I want to, to tell you about the way polarity, distrust, filter bubbles are built into the design of social media. And I'll, again, using that as an example, right? So think about, um, let's do pro-Trump and anti-Trump. Think about the fact that we all, the whole idea of democracy is actually that we believe in shared facts, that facts are not debatable. This is a cup of coffee, right? If I show you, this is a cup of coffee. Um, but if you, if Carla tells me, no, Maria, that's not a cup of coffee, that's an apple. Imagine if, if we don't agree that this is a cup of coffee. That's precisely what happened with social media. So think about this as the center where we all agree on facts, right? And then what happened? Why was social media so divisive? Because tech people, the designers of social media, decided that they optimized the platform for growth. And so what they did is they did something very simple. It's a simple idea that seeded this kind of polarity into all of our organizations, the beginning of the attacks against us. What was that? It's this idea that um, they grew the platform, they pushed growth using friends of friends. There's a great paper by Mark Granovetter called The Strength of Weak Ties, right? So that's this idea of friends of friends. They grew it that way. Now, imagine this is what happens when um, we grow a platform, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, whichever social media platform, using friends of friends. If you're pro-Trump, this is pro-Trump, this is anti-Trump, right? So let's just say you're pro-Trump. Most of your friends will tend to be pro-Trump, right? So you actually are fed. The social media platform recommends uh, more friends like you, friends of friends. And slowly, because 
you are growing your network using friends of friends, you're going to move here. Meantime, if you're anti-Trump, friends of friends, you're slowly going to move here. And then as the platform grows more and more, you're all going to move here. And what happens? The pro-Trump people don't actually ever see the arguments of the anti-Trump people, and they move further away from each other. And then what's wrecked here? This huge gaping hole? That's where the fact should be. So this is, this is built into social media platforms. Eli Pariser wrote a book very, very early on. It's called, Fil where he, he coined filter bubbles, right? So these are our filter bubbles. But I think it was only in 2018 when people began realizing, oh my God, it isn't just, they're just it's not just about filter bubbles. It's imagine, and you got this quote, because I say it often, if you don't have facts, you cannot have democracy because the whole idea of facts is that every citizen in a democracy will take the facts, their appreciation of the facts, and they will make a choice, whether it is for an election or whether it is for a policy, right? If you don't have the facts, you can't make a choice. And, and this is the second point I'll make before, before I bring it to Carla. The second point is that if we are being manipulated, and that is active, they're called influence operations or information operations. Um, how do we defend ourselves against it? Well, you can't. That's actually what we're coming down to. So Rappler, even while we've been under attack, we're building our own technology platform. And one of the things we realized is that news organizations, we only focused on on the reporting because frankly that was all we thought our job was but the reality is that our power as journalists as news organizations came from our power to distribute the news to distribute the facts what happens when you no longer have the power to distribute the facts because that power was stripped away from us in and i would say it was brewing but that power was stripped away from us in 2015 when we all joined instant articles on Facebook. That was around the time when Facebook enticed news organizations to come join the platform using the same algorithms that they would use to spread uh, gossip, right? Or to spread a joke. That's how important facts were to the social media platforms. So, um, what happens when we don't have that? Well, here it is, the goal of influence operations, and let me take this from Russian disinformation, right? And, and I'll, I'll start, I'll tell you about that because it's already been proven that Americans, and I would think Puerto Rico would have some part of this because I've seen it in some of the data that we've seen, that Americans were targeted by Russian disinformation operations in 2016. The Mueller report already documents it. In 2018, in December 2018, data was released uh, to two groups, to New Knowledge and Graphica, that showed you how the IRA, the Internet Research Agency, and the intelligence group, the GRU of Russia, actually pounded fracture lines of society. This is what they do when they pound that when you are the target of that, the first goal is to pound you to silence, to make you doubt yourself. The second goal is to create a bandwagon effect. It's called, I call it manufactured, actually it's not me. Um, manufactured consensus is, was coined by the Oxford Computational Propaganda Research Group at Oxford University, right? So they, they create a fake bandwagon effect so that you think that a lot more people think this, even though that's not true. In my case, it would be, say, popular, the popularity of President Duterte, right? Because, because perception definitely impacts reality, right? The third thing that that attack does, and this is what I wanted to show you in the presentation. I can share it 
with Carla and Rigel later. But you know, the end goal is to dehumanize the target, to make online violence the norm. Because when you make people emotional, they don't think. That's actually what the social media platforms are doing to us. Uh, there's a great book by Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. When we're thinking fast, those are the two systems of thinking. When we're thinking fast, we're not rational. And part of the reason lies spread so fast on these platforms is because they're optimized optimized for growth, optimized for the worst of human nature. Anger, jealousy, envy, fear, fear and anger, fear and violence. Fear and violence is how my president, President Duterte leads. That's what we've lived under, right? That's why the drug war. Anyway, so let me bring it back to um, influence operations. It's been proven that Americans are targeted. And the goal of influence operations, so if you think about the, our screen as a closed system, social media platform, um, think about the virus of lies, right? That's, that's, these are, it's not about one-off getting you to just click on a story of a lie. It's not that. It's about building narratives. So here's the narrative of lies the narrative of journalist equals criminal. You throw that into a closed system, it's like a virus, like the pandemic, right? So that is meant to influence real people. And when that infects real people, they change the way they think and ultimately the way they act. So take a look at the influence operations in the United States. An easy one in 2016, documented, is the attack on both sides of Black Lives Matter. Um, race and identity. This is very personal and that was attacked on both sides. And when that was pounded open, torn apart four years ago, it didn't really stop. The narratives kept coming and real people were changed. Fast forward four years and you can see how this is in, in mainland United States. This is a, a, a massive change. Some will say, okay, for good, I don't know. When you're being manipulated, when your uh, weaknesses are being manipulated, I can't see how that can ever be for good. Um, and I'll end with this. Um, last week was the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima, of, of the dropping of the atomic bomb in, in Japan. And I was there, I covered the 50th anniversary uh, for CNN. Uh, and I was there for, uh, in 2015 again. When you go to Hiroshima, you're, I was struck by how the Hibakushas, the people who lived through it, See, they make me emotional. How, how they were so peaceful and how their message was about how do we learn from this? And I thought about this last week when I saw the anniversary, because I was like, oh my God, imagine if those people who suffered so much were manipulated. That's what's happening to us. Oh boy, I better take a cup of, drink my coffee and I guess I see some of your, your comments. I will send you the presentation. Uh, I will show you the nastiness because this is the kind of stuff that we go up to now, right? So, um, and I hadn't actually shown this before because I figured like, you know, this is, every one of us has this, but I started showing it because it shows you how it, it, it pushes hate how it dehumanizes you, how it's not just the threats. It's not just, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to rape you, rape you. Those things are almost passe. <laughs> you know, it is, there's a nickname that the propaganda machine in the Philippines that they pounded just like journalist equals criminal. They called me scrotum face and they had some really nasty stuff because I have dry skin. 
You can't see it now because I actually slept, even though I woke up early for you. But, you know, I have eczema and they took a vulnerability or what they perceived to be a vulnerability and they pounded it. They made it a code word. And the end goal, of course, is to impact you first, me. So the last advice I would give before I turn to Carla is um, whatever it is you feel most afraid of, touch it and embrace it. Because if you do good journalistic work, you will be attacked. If you investigate corruption, you will be attacked. And it's no longer just from power. What power does now is to manipulate real people, to turn them against journalists. So we can't let that get in the way. So the, the, the first thing is to fight that battle in your mind, you know, figure out how you feel and embrace it and take the sting out of it. We need to move beyond our fears. That's what we're forced to do. So anyway, 20 minutes of questions because I do want to hear your questions. Carla, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, we have uh, so much, so many things to talk about. <laughs> um, I am going to start and, and the, the audience also have some, so I'll try to go as fast as possible. Um, in one of your earlier speeches, speeches at Princeton earlier this year, you talked about uh, media being weaponized, weaponizing the media. Can you expand on that concept and um, about uh, who specifically are the powers that are weaponizing the media? Sure. So this goes off of what I just said, which is, you know, the virus of lies starts on social media, right? So part of what, I, what we're now calling the dictator's playbook. So it began, the one documentation that we have seen goes back to 2014. I mean, it started before that because propaganda has been around forever, but the exponential spread, the alternate realities, the first alternate reality that the world really saw was the Ukraine, right? Russia was saying one thing and then what was happening on the ground at the Ukraine was another. And they were, to the rest of us around the world, it, reality was debatable when, frankly, reality is never debatable. The facts aren't debatable, right? So, so in 2014, we saw it starkly. Um, but I, I guess now, now more than ever, we know information is power because that information, that narrative that's seeded on social media is picked up by traditional media. And if you're interested in this work, uh, the, especially the work in the United States, uh, Kathleen Hall Jameson wrote a book, uh, which was, I thought it was on my desk, but she wrote this great book uh, that took a look at how these false information on social media, the lies, were picked up by uh, traditional media. And her work is complemented by uh, Yochai Benkler from MIT. He looked at how uh, a, a reporter, an American reporter for RT, some of their work was picked up by Fox News and then amplified, seeds into uh, our, our consciousness because traditional media just amplified it. Uh, and a, a good example of this would be some of the attacks against, and this is in Jameson's book. She's a professor at Annenberg University at the University of, Penn, at Annenberg Center in the University of Penn, Pennsylvania. She looked at what um, traditional media picked up of the attacks against Hillary Clinton that were seeded by Russian disinformation. So that was fascinating to me. So this is how media is weaponized. We may not know it, um, but we can pick up things from social media. We know for sure. That's why I go back to social media as ground zero, right? That is where we need to actually clean it up so that the lies don't spread faster than the facts. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, 
later we will talk about specific suggestions for that to happen. Um, I, I, you were saying, uh, you, you, ha you, you just said that um, the first step in this ecosystem of uh, misinformation and, um, and uh, alternate truth is uh, how they make you doubt yourself. Um, I think uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, we have felt that as journalists. Um, probably many journalists are feeling this uh, today everywhere, but in Puerto Rico at CPI and also other colleagues, we have been threatened with uh, lawsuits for doing investigations and, and reporting about government corruption. Um, right. one of, um, some of the characters of these uh, corruption schemes have threatened CPI of suing us for alleged libel. And um, I wonder, um, how do you deal with these kinds of uh, threats uh, poten that potentially put you in a position at least in Puerto Rico uh, legal system of uh, considering uh, that you would go to jail, not because you committed libel, but because being in the position of being asked to reveal your source. Um, so um, I, I wonder, you know, at least personally, as, as a human being, what goes through your mind and how you deal with that. That's a great question, and I'll I'll start first with uh, the macro picture because I think journalists are facing this all around the world, right? The weaponization of the law. There's even a phrase that uh, our, our one of our senators who fought President Duterte uh, very publicly was investigating him for alleged uh, extrajudicial killings. She's been in prison since 2017. She coined lawfare, lawfare, weaponizing the law, law as warfare. Uh, you have in, in Britain, for example, uh, their laws are, are, are almost make it so difficult for news organizations not to be afraid of these types of, of legal attacks. Uh, there's a whole group now that is trying to create a legal defense fund. Mm -hmm. uh, the Press Freedom Defense Fund, for example, is a group that is trying to to bring in money so that when when you get a lawsuit against you, that you feel you're not alone. And CPI, you must continue investigative reporting because, you know, the end goal of all of this is to make us stop, to make us stop holding power to account. Um, so that that's the first is, you know, I think, Carla, we, we can send some resources, but, you know, certainly the threat of a legal suit shouldn't stop you from doing the, and that's easier said than done, right? Let me talk about it from my personal perspective. Good God, you know, I, like I said, I told you by next year, I will have been a journalist for 35 years. Uh, before this raft of cases was filed against me in 2018, um, the most that had ever happened to me legally, and I had set up the Manila Bureau for CNN. I set up the Jakarta Bureau for CNN. I spent eight months setting up the Jakarta Bureau. I, you know, so we looked very closely at, at things like this, something, by the way, the tech platforms don't do because they just pop up in each of our countries. Uh, anyway, so uh, the goal of, of, of all of this is to try to uh, prevent us from doing what we're supposed to do. Sorry, I, I lost the train of thought in, in that, right? So the, remind me again, Carla. Ah, personal, personal, yes. personal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What so goes the, through your mind and uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. how do you process that? Well, so I was going to say before this legal cases, the most I had that had ever happened to me was when I almost got thrown out of Malaysia. I don't know, you, um, I don't know if you remember when Anwar Ibrahim, who was the deputy prime minister, uh, the court cases against him began and I was sitting in the court, right? And I was trying to get stuff out and, and the government almost threw me out. They delayed CNN's broadcast by mm -hmm. two minutes and then started to censor what, what we were broadcasting. Mm -hmm. Before that, the, there's been no problems with the law. So how do I deal with it? Uh, I think about it as 
pollution, you know, in, in a strange way, it becomes part of the landscape the same way I've accepted that the attacks against me on social media are meant to, uh, to make a trade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, diminish. Actually, more than diminish. I would say it's meant to dehumanize, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Because the end goal is to make you ludicrous. So, you know, we saw this happen to Senator Lila de Lima, who's been in prison for more than three years. She was first attacked exponentially for being corrupt. There was never any evidence. Then the second attacks against her were sexual, sexualized, gendered attacks. Then the third were all uh, releasing these videos that were sexual. And then after that, dehumanizing. The same things that have happened to me. And in some ways, that's a little bit harder to deal with than the legal attacks. Isn't that crazy? Because these are very personal. So how do I, how do I deal with it? Uh, so one, we began a crowdfunding campaign for legal fees because it will be expensive. And if we had not had our community here and around the world help us, we would have been bankrupt. Because think about it like this. I have a, our news group is about 100 people strong, right? And we, we were forced to, beginning in 2018, to spend a third of the money we would normally use for operations on legal fees. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you, you're talking about, about $40,000 a month. That's crazy. Um, so it, it, it's a war of attrition. So that, that's one. The second is, and CPI is doing this. This is what you're doing in your fund drive. Pull your community together. You have to tell them what is happening and how we are gonna get through this. Because in the end, we remember, and this is where journalists globally can do better. Sometimes we think that we just do the stories, but what's the goal of doing the stories? It's for our community, right? So we pull our community together. We tell them, this is what's happening to us. Uh, this is how you can help. And you will be surprised yeah. at how they want to help you. Because in the end, this is about, this is about them. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not about it. It's never been about us, uh, but we are the first line of defense. And when our community sees that we are under attack, if we do our jobs well, we can galvanize our community to protect our democracy. That's what we're trying to do. Look, I, I, it's hard. <laughs> it's very hard. I was telling you how we were trying to still build a, a platform. Right. And um our community, because if you are scared, your community will be scared. And, and that's why, you know, our, so in the Philippines, our hashtags have evolved in the last four years. First, it started with hashtag inspire courage. And we ran that hashtag for two years because we realized people were afraid because our government was using violence and fear. Mm -hmm. And then we evolved it to hashtag courage on. So here's that last part. These times, they really demand that every person in a democracy look at themselves and figure out how important these rights are to them. Because this is it. Like, we're all going to have to fight for democracy. The world is swinging the other way. It is moving towards fascism. If you want, you know, a kind of quick prescriptive, like what we should be doing, Tim Snyder, he's a Yale historian. Uh, he's been, uh, he wrote a great book. It's, it's short, it's 150 pages, very prescriptive, 20 things we can do against tyranny. And it is crazy to use the word tyranny or fascism today. It was six months ago for me, but guess what? That's where we are today. Anyway, I'll shut up, Carla. <laughs> I'll send back to you. Um, you're making me emotional by making me talk. <laughs> well, you know, this is uh, what we wanted um, our audience to feel, you know, and the community we have that supports CPI sometimes only reads our stories but uh, doesn't get to see 
um, the, the behind the scenes, the problems we face with uh, social media, etc. This is all um, off uh, camera. So I think it's very important with this conference and with your um, testimony that people start to understand not only what are the challenges that we face in Puerto Rico, but most journalists, especially journalists in independent media. And I wanted to go there um, um, because uh, Facebook specifically uh, poses uh, a threat to, to independent media because it controls and limits um, its distribution and the exposition of our stories and investigations. Um, the ones for, uh, from CPI, for instance, are constantly filtered um, by Facebook in ways that prevent uh, them uh, to reach wider audiences. Um, Rappler was uh, a Facebook-born media outlet for almost one year before going into an a independent platform, you know, a website. Um, what made you decide uh, to, to do that transition? And has your vocal criticism um, about how Facebook deals with the fake news, for example, has had any consequence on, on Rappler's work? Uh, so I'll try to, to make it concise because that's a huge question. So I yes, we, we started out on Facebook in 20, Oh my gosh, the end of 2011. So it would have been like September, October, November. And during that time period, uh, I, if Facebook had better search, maybe we wouldn't have built a website. But Facebook search was really bad at that point in time. I was, I really believed in social networking and social platforms because the, the second book I wrote is called From Bin Laden to Facebook. Uh, I looked at the way this virulent ideology, you know, imagine terrorists were using social networks, their family and friends to spread this idea of, you know, go and kill yourself. Suicide bombing was spreading this way. And I was thinking, my God, how, how did they do that? And then how did it shift to social media? So I wrote that book just a little bit before ISIS actually began using social media, right? Because if you think about it, social media is actually, what's the definition? It's your family and friends on steroids because everything that we do person to person, when you put it on social media, you multiply that times four. So this is how much faith I had, at least it was the experiment. But we, we were building our tech platform as we were experimenting with Facebook. Um, I'm glad that we rolled it out in 2012, in January of 2012. And then we realized part of it is because, and I would encourage every news group to do this, uh, don't outsource things that are critical to your survival, like your users, your audience. So you need to know who your audience members are. You need to know what they're reading, what they want, because this is, uh, they're who we serve, right? Um, the, it was very good up until 2015, because that's, I would, I pegged that to when instant articles happened. And then 2016, the dominoes began to fall, right? And yet globally, the way of alternate realities, that really began in 2014. So if you look at the timeline, everything was okay until 2014. And then 2014, you saw Russia find this realization, the United States was still sleeping, it seemed like, right, that they could manipulate American social media to actually change reality. And we saw that in the Ukraine in 2015, instant articles. Essentially, Facebook wanted to be Twitter. And, you know, they're very different in algorithms, these things. And something that is chronological real time is different when algorithms decide what they're going to show you, right? So it's not in our, it's not in your control. Um, and then the dominoes began to fall. So from 2012 to 2016, 
Rappler was growing 100% to 300% year on year using social media. That is in both reach and revenue. And then in 2016, the very same platforms that we used to grow our community was then used to try to kill us. Yeah. And that's still happening, mm -hmm. right? So yes, did, did it matter that we were, that I've, I've been quite vocal? Yes, it matters. Because in 2016, we did our first, part of the reason we came under attack is because we did something called the propaganda series. I wrote two of three parts of this thing in 2016. And one of those two stories was um, actually, it was how Facebook algorithms impact democracy. That was a title mm -hmm. in 2016, right? So uh, another one of the stories is how, how 26 fake accounts can influence up to 3 million others. That was huge to me. And um, so if we had not done that, Maybe we wouldn't have come under attack, but you know what? We also would not have alerted our community. And Filipinos perhaps would be far more trusting, meaning they would have their trust destroyed even more if we hadn't warned them that this is coming. So it's a tough world for journalists. I don't think it's demanded this much from us. In, in the 30, 34 years that I've been here, I. I I feel like, you know, being in a war zone is easier than living in our world today as journalists. And yet the mission of journalism, holding power to account is so much more critical today than it has ever been. So you are at the front lines, you know this, and mm -hmm. think about it like that, right? We are going to have to fortify, not just ourselves individually. Remember the battle begins in your mind uh, but our community as well, we need to share what we know. Carla, if you're not telling your community what you're going through, then you're not giving them uh, insights and you're not telling them how hard it's going to be because what you are going through today, they are going to be going through. You're the first line. Uh, but if you fold or if it doesn't work, they will then attack and they are being attacked individually anyway. Mm -hmm. So yes, share it with them. You must, because if you don't, um, you leave them vulnerable. Yeah, and I think um, the, the audience is starting to get this point because we have three, at least three questions that are very related to that point. So I'll, I'll try to merge them because they are directly related. One says, uh, how can non-journalist populations better support journalists as CPI beyond reading content, sharing, or uh, participating in fundraising? What else can community do? The other one is um, about the role of community engagement in protecting journalists. And um, the third one is, uh, how can journalists create trust uh, between community and journalists, especially when political leaders create distrust between the community and the journalists by saying comments such as fake news, as we know in the US, but here in Puerto Rico, also dismissing uh, a lot of uh, questions and, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the reporting, let's say, uh, from journalists from CPI, for example. Those are all great questions and thank you for them. So let me try to take them apart. So the term fake news is code for news I don't like, right? For power. That's essentially, and, and I'm paraphrasing for you something that Christian Amanpour just said last night to us. Uh, so that is global in scope. And, um, it, and it is a way, I, I would say right now, uh, power has gained more power because when trust is destroyed, when journalists are attacked in the way that we have been, trust is destroyed. You know, it doesn't matter whether or not I've been a good journalist when, when some Filipinos, and I would say a lot more Filipinos believe I'm a criminal. That's a reality I have to live with now. And I, um, you know, and I can't say, look at my track record because Social media is so ephemeral, right? They don't care. And that's another reality. 
So you, I, you I, also, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but oh, uh, go, go. We, we saw in your video that you also have a, a very fierce supporters that, um, you know, accompany and, and, and follow you, uh, you know, asking for you to be uh, left out of Yale or supporting very publicly your work. So uh, you have both uh, kinds of uh, people, right? Uh, uh, receiving your work and uh, standing, some, some of them standing up to you, for you. Yes, but there are costs to them. So, for example, you know, just yesterday, uh, one of the leaders was actually killed in his own home. This is how far it goes. Look, I think you're still, you're in a better place. Don't let it regress. Let me, let me quickly answer those three things, right? Uh, and I will tell you the same thing that I tell Filipinos, which is um, today protecting democracy protecting, building community is not just the journalist's job. Uh, we're willing to go further. We have a sense of standards and ethics and a sense of mission. You do at CPI, uh, but it, it isn't just us. So I guess the, the question I always ask is this, and every person in a democracy has to ask this of themselves. What are you willing to sacrifice for the facts? And let me make that sexier. What are you willing to sacrifice for truth? Because truth doesn't exist without facts. Facts are not debatable. That is how much our information ecosystem has degenerated, mm -hmm. right? Facts are debatable. So the, that's the first thing that, you know, it, it, if, if we tell our community, if everyone in your community begins to realize they have a stake in this, then you can build a stronger community. That leads to the second question, which is, you know, so what else can you do aside from supporting CPI? Um, I have three things you can do. The first is um, you are more powerful than we are in the Philippines because you're closer to the U.S. I hate to say this, Americans will have more power, demand accountability from the social media platforms. Mm -hmm. They cannot allow lies laced with anger and hate to spread faster than facts. They cannot allow blatantly illegal attacks on journalists, on activists, uh, genocide in the case of Myanmar. They cannot allow this to happen with impunity. Because, you know, in my mind, I am fighting the impunity of my government as much as I'm fighting the impunity of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And your voice is worth more than mine all the way on the other side of the Pacific, right? That's the second. The third is that you have to realize that talking to each other, building community is huge because that is the antidote to the fake community that social media provides. Right? Um, and, and let me say it that way. Look at how critical it is to our mission in Rappler. The elevator pitch for Rappler when we created this in 2012 is one sentence. We build communities of action. And the way we did it was investigative journalism. Here's my Venn diagram. Investigative journalism, combine it with technology to build community. Community is at the heart of what we do. And we always felt that, because I spent so much of my career throwing stories into a black hole. That's the way I felt when I was working for CNN. I was a translator. I was taking my world, what I lived in, and translating it for the West, for Europe, for the United States. But the reason I came home is because I wanted to see impact in our work. And Puerto Rico, for all of the things that you have gone through, you know, the hurricane, the earthquakes, good God. I actually, you know, it's like the war, it's like the Philippines, <laughs> although you have better rule of law, I think. Um, they're well, not killing people yet. So that's, anyway, let me rephrase that in case my government is there. 
impunity is something we can fight, but we cannot do it alone. We have to fight it together as a community. And that is how we have impact as journalists, mm -hmm. right? You build community and the stories you do, that's the food you feed the community so it knows what actions it wants to take. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, Maria, I don't know if we have much time left, but um, I, I, I have a question that may be a way of, um, of uh, getting out of uh, the discussion and um, maybe give us some shared uh, thoughts. Uh, you, when you were in Hamburg, um, you talked about, you know, I, I think we have a shared history um, in terms of we, we are islands to start with. Um, the Philippines was colonized by Spain too. Um, and then uh, Spain had to ha hand over uh, Philippine islands to the United States. And, um, but you had your, your independence process uh, a process that we haven't had the possibility uh, for. Um, you quoted in Hamburg that colon you were quoting someone else when saying colonialism never died, it just moved online. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, yes. uh, it was part of your remarks and it, it struck me that um, it is an in interest interesting discussion about how um, the, co the countries that are, are going through a, a colonialism uh, process or have gone through um, live this uh, or deals with uh, social media platforms etc since we are always feeling so little. Uh, we are we are always um, dealing with this um, self-esteem problem, uh, being uh, being colonies, and uh, maybe feeling that we who who are we uh, to do what you were saying, for example, to stand yeah. up to, to Facebook, for example. Yeah. So um, I wonder what made you pick that quote in Hamburg. Uh, how, how did you felt it resonated with Philippines history? So uh, the quote that you mentioned, uh, colonialism never dies, it just moves online. That came from the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, Christopher mm -hmm. Wiley. I don't mm -hmm. know if you guys remember, right? So, uh, and again, this is interesting because this is where I'll turn it around on you. Why, how do we gain our power? The Philippines, like Puerto Rico, we didn't really have a revolution. And that may be part of our problem is that, you know, our, our historical, our colonial past actually showed us always shifting to our colonizers. Um, unlike, say, Indonesia, which really did fight. They had a revolution. Um, so what Wiley was saying there is, and it's so complex, he actually, remember Cambridge Analytica, the most number of compromised accounts on Facebook were American accounts. But the country with the second most number of compromised accounts was the Philippines. And Christopher Wiley also said that the Philippines was a Petri dish. And he said that uh, Cambridge Analytica and its parent company, SEL, actually tested tactics of manipulation in the Philippines, because we're 110 million people, and if it worked here, they, his word was, ported it over to you, to the West. Um, so here's where it turns around. The former colonized then became the test case for how to manipulate the colonized, the masters. And what worked here is what they then used against Americans. Where do I put Puerto Rico? You are Americans, I guess, <laughs> right? So, so you, are, so that's here. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's interesting. That's also fascinating. What does that mean for identity, right? So, and if th that is fascinating, that means that will be a fracture line in your society, and you will need to protect that. 
because if you do get targeted, that will be one of the first targets influence operations will attack. So I guess what, what I'm saying now is how do we gain our, our, our identity as you know, being the former colonized? Well, I joke all the time now that the United States is actually now following the Philippines. <laughs> our dystopian present is, is their dystopian future. That was, I said that two years ago or three years ago. Today, you're living it. I have no idea how you will have integrity of elections if you don't have integrity of facts. It's a collective illusion right now. You're trusting social media platforms. And I guess the last point I will, I will make here is that, you know, digital colonialism, look, the decisions made in Silicon Valley trickle to us. I could go to jail because of those decisions. This is how, how weak, how they have destroyed our democracy. Ah, let me take another deep breath. So uh, I'm just saying that, let me throw it to Myanmar, where the UN actually sent a fact-finding team. The head of that group is a man I know. He was the former head of the Commission on Human Rights in Indonesia, Marzuki Darusman. And he came out with a report that was also validated by Facebook itself, that the social media platform contributed to genocide. Genocide. This is a given. As early as 2018. And yet no one has been held accountable for that, right? I mean, the generals in Myanmar, they were taken off of Facebook. Facebook took them out. But it continues. And that is the problem, that these decisions in Silicon Valley impact the entire world and countries in the global south. Our democracies, our institutions are just frailer. Mm -hmm. Ours, I would say, would have collapsed in the first six months of the administration, the Duterte administration. So. Uh, I leave, you know, the last word I would say is that you are not where we are. Use us as a cautionary tale. Build, right? Uh, I saw some of the questions saying, you know, so how do you stay optimistic? Because our future is still in our hands. You're supporting CPI, right? So that's great. You have to just accept that our world, the world that we knew, the old information ecosystem is demolished. We're standing on the rubble of what the world used to be. And we have to be more agile. We have to be more courageous. And we have to be excited by building the future. Building our present will build the future. Just because we're under attack doesn't mean that we will not push back. And it doesn't mean that we won't build a better future. I think that's the opportunity. And that's why I stay optimistic, because I think that the world that we knew wasn't so very good, right? It wasn't. So <laughs> I, I gave the commencement speech to Princeton University's class of 2020. It was a, a great honor to do it. And one of the things I, I said is that, look, like, we're, the world today is horrendous. Uh, we can be afraid of so many things, but we can also seize it as an opportunity to build a better world. You know, one that is more equal, more sustainable for sure. Climate change, you feel, oh my gosh, we're going, actually when I looked at what you had lived through in Puerto Rico, they're, they're exactly what the Philippines has lived through. Um, and then the third part is more compassionate. This is what social media has destroyed. Mm -hmm. and. You know, I think you are like us. In the end, our values, we believe in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. You know, we believe in the goodness of human nature. And I think that's, that's one of the things. We can build it back in. So that's what keeps me excited. That's what keeps me going. Thank you for, for you know, for this conversation. Um, thank you for the work you do. I want to thank all of our viewers, uh, our audience, um, you know, our readers and our journalists too who are listening tonight. Um, and thank you for the support that they give us uh, every day. 
because uh, as you said, if we didn't have this community of support, uh, we'd be on the floor <laughs> uh, just hearing what politicians or government officials talk about us, right? So thank you so much for, for this and um, I hope everyone um, have the opportunity to understand uh, things that are very complex and that are not um, sometimes so simple to explain, but um, these are the, the challenges that we are facing and uh, I think it's important, it was important that you talk about them and um, it, it came from another experience, you know, because we learned a lot from this. Thank you, Maria, and thanks, everyone. Good night. Buenas noches. Thank you for having me, Carla. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everybody, for your time. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye.